Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to Bridges of Belonging. This is our fourth conversation and uh, just really thrilled to continue the dialogue. We've had some really amazing conversations over the last four weeks and I'm really excited to have our two guests here with us today. I want to begin by acknowledging the uh, territory of the Coast Salish people, whose territory I've had the opportunity to be a guest on for the last 23 years here in Victoria. And it's the uh, traditional territory of the Esquimalt and the Songhees nations. And um, it's just been an incredible gift for me to live, work, and play here. And especially the last few weeks where um, I've just really appreciated the stewardship of the lands and knowing that I have a safe place to be during some really tumultuous times. Um, these sessions are being recorded, so if you're uncomfortable with that, then please keep your video off and um, don't uh, activate your mic at any point. And um, you can change your name to be anonymous as well. But um, yeah, now we're going to move on to the session. So just really want to welcome everyone to the session. Appreciate that people have taken their time to join Bridges of Belonging conversations and to look at how we create more belonging in the spaces and places that we are. Today's conversation, I'm so excited to have Tim Adams and Karen O'Neill with us, um, both of whom I just respect and care about so much and just really appreciate the gifts that they bring to the world and um, to my life as well. And wanted to be able to share each of them with you as a broader audience and kind of uh, an opportunity to experience this conversation together. Um, I'm going to start by uh, doing a quote, or a reading actually, which I do each week. So today's uh, reading is from Together, which is a book that just came out about a month ago from um, Vivek Murphy. And Vivek is a, uh, he was the 19th Surgeon General of the United States. And um, as he went into that role, he went in with sort of thinking he was going to talk about all of these different things around tobacco and vaping and huge health issues. And what he ended up spending a lot of time on was the topic of loneliness. And uh, loneliness seemed like a, a totally random topic, but it connected to everything that he did while he was in that role. And he went on to write this book. So I came across him a few weeks ago on a podcast um, with Brené Brown, actually, and just really loved the uh, message he was sharing and thought it connected so well to Bridges of Belonging. So I have a really short reading today um, from his book. So here we go. To be at home is to be known. It is to be loved for who you are. It is to share a sense of common ground, common interests, pursuits, and values with others who truly care about you. In community after community, I met lonely people who felt homeless even though they had a roof over their heads. So with that, I'm gonna introduce our two speakers today. Karen O'Neill is a senior executive in Canada's sports community with expertise in several leadership roles. She joined the Canadian Paralympic Committee as the CEO in 2013 after serving as the CEO of Field Hockey Canada and the Chief Operating Officer of the Rick Hansen Foundation. Karen is also a current member of the True Sport Foundation Board of Directors, which supports values-based sport. She's originally from Halifax, Nova Scotia, holds a master's degree in education from McGill University, and a Bachelor's of Arts in Psychology from Concordia University. Welcome, Karen. Thanks. Tim Adams is the founder and executive director of Free Footy. He created Free Footy while working as a journalist for CBC and noticed the need for free, inclusive sport. His program began with 40 kids playing soccer, and now there are 4,000 kids playing soccer, basketball, and hockey. They've also introduced leadership programs for older youth to learn how to be a referee or coach in multiple sports. Tim's hope is that one day soon, a youth who has played, refed, and coached in the program will come back and run it, and run him out of a job, he would always say. <laughs> I'm never seen it up, waiting for those children to <laughs> Exactly. Um, so with that, we're actually going to turn it over to Tim to kick us off telling us a little bit more about him and a bit more of a personal story than the bio I just read <laughs> and some of his journey. So welcome, Tim. 
Yeah, thank you so much for having me. And I appreciate to be sharing the digital stage with such a titan in sport and community and developing belonging. So thank you for giving me a bit of room to talk here. Um, yeah, my adventure really started as a journalist at CBC and I was going to do a story at a very high need school. It was uh, at the time coded as the highest need school in Edmonton. And I went to do a story about, uh, it was a junk food ban that was coming in place across all public schools. And this school in particular already had the ban in place because the kids who were going there needed to um, eat healthy. And the school needed to ensure that what they were eating was healthy because often they weren't getting the meals that they might need at home. Um, they'd be lucky if they were getting a, a good meal a day. So I went there to sort of the shining example of what um, uh, a junk food ban could look like in schools across the city. And after the microphone went off, that turned into um, me talking with the principal about how I just moved to Edmonton and I played the sport at a fairly high level in different sports. And I was calling around all the different provincial associations and clubs looking for a place where I could give some of my time. And I really wanted to coach soccer at the time. That was sort of my game. And she said, well, look out the window. And there was all these kids from all around the world playing the classic uh, barefoot football that we don't see hardly ever anymore. <laughs> because kids don't seem to go out and play like they used to in the good old days. Um, but they were playing barefoot, uh, heel was kicking their butt on every single stride, hips were hanging low, like natural runners. And I just turned back to the principal and said, who are these kids? And she said, that's your team. And so that turned into me coaching that team a day a week, a couple days a week, three days a week, four days a week, um, being the sort of uh, mentor, and in a lot of cases, the role model and father figure for a lot of kids who came from really challenging backgrounds. Lots of kids on my team were refugees, um, living in care, foster care, living in youth uh, shelters. Um, kids who just had a lot of challenge around them, but had this amazing uh, level of worth ethic, determination, grit, and kids who just really wanted to have someone believe in them. And so that kind of turned into this team where we went on to do lots of cool things. And at the same time, there was all their little brothers and sisters who used to have to come along with them because my kids, my team was the eldest group in the family. And that meant if you're the eldest, you have to look after your little brothers and sisters. So that meant the whole family would come to a practice and the whole family would come to a game. So I'd get off the bus with my 10, uh, 15 kids, and then there'd be another 50 kids there as well. And it became quickly very unsustainable to show up at a game with 50 kids running all over the place and uh, complete chaos. So that turned into starting a team for the little guys and girls, um, and there was nowhere for them to play. So that turned into a league by asking three more schools in the area if they would participate. And then uh, that was a little league of four, and then that turned to eight, 16, 26. And this year, as of the spring, we were supposed to have 68 schools participating with two teams per school. Uh, it's also turned into us playing, as Andrea mentioned, basketball, floor hockey, um, flag football, touch rugby, year-round program, creating a leadership program for the kids that used to age out at grade six. And we kind of got a wall of feedback recently saying, you got to stop that. You got to figure out a way for them to continue. And we really started looking around at this belonging question as well of um, where are these kids going after they finish playing? Like how come we're not seeing them come back in these leadership roles? And it was because quite frankly, no one was really giving them the chance to serve in those leadership roles. They were ready and they were great kids, but they didn't have those opportunities that a lot of us are blessed to have. So we created a junior referee program where the junior high kids, they can come back and learn to be a ref and get their certification as a referee. And then they can continue on in high school where they learn to be a coach and they come back and coach um, the program. And then the eventual hope is once they've gone through the full system, they come back as a staff and as Andrea mentioned, then they sit in this chair and do this interview and take over and run the organization um, with a great community lens. The people who are from the community serve their community. So that's sort of the full quick nuts and bolts version of what Free Footy has been like over the last 13 years now. Yeah. Does that, does that help give enough context? I love it. You, uh, you spoke a ton about Free Footy. Tell us a little bit more about you. Oh, oh yeah, sure. Um, <laughs> sorry, I uh, I grew up in small town Ontario in a place called Deep River. You may have heard of it. It is the town that houses all the scientists for Chalk River, and Chalk River was the main nuclear research well, still is the main nuclear research laboratory in the country. And uh, so Deep River had this really weird relationship of uh, 
had the high for a while had the highest number of PhDs per capita in the world. So all these smart people live there. And if you weren't a smart person, <laughs> AKA me, if you weren't a science and math person, you really didn't, it was hard to fit in. It was hard to belong. So I grew up in a community where I needed to find other things to do. And other things to do for me was being on every single sports team that existed, spending a ton of my time in a canoe and in a tent and on my bike. Um, and that's sort of how I grew up. And I had a sort of a life-changing program that I participated in. It was an outdoor recreation program in high school. And that sort of changed me and got me really into the idea of writing, surprisingly. I really love writing. And that turned into going to journalism school at Carleton University, where I got a journalism degree and uh, a major with English and a minor in geography. And then uh, I got a call from the CBC to come work for them. And they said, uh, where would you like to work? I said, send me anywhere west. That was it. And I uh, got a call that you're going to Edmonton. So I left with my bike and my hockey bag. And that is it. And I've never left. <laughs> and uh, over the years, I worked for CBC as a reporter, doing all kinds of things. I was the city hall reporter here for a really long time. I've covered the legislature. I've covered countless elections. Covered everything from, you know, the tragic murder court stories to... Um, I was the main reporter during Afghanistan here. Edmonton has a huge base. And I was the main reporter covering a lot of those stories when lots of the soldiers were killed and I was the one talking to families. Um, yeah, I've kind of experienced the whole gamut of life through journalism, which is why I think I also ended up here is because I got to see all the different people who are doing great things, but I also got to see all the different pain. And I kind of got tired of telling stories about it. It does make an impact. Don't get me wrong. Journalism makes a fantastic impact. But at some point, you want to be the doer versus the person telling the story. And I was running this organization on the side. And I was like, I, it's time for me to be the doer and like really, um, you know, walk the walk, walk the talk. Um, so I, I left CBC uh, for a year leave of absence. And then I was supposed to go back last August, was it now? And I sent them a letter saying, no, I'm not going back. I have free food. He needs me a bit longer. So yeah, that's kind of my, my Edmonton life story too. <laughs> that's amazing. Thank you for that. I think that yeah. sets a really good base and tone for both what you've gone on to do with free footy and then sort of how we can navigate some of this discussion today. So yeah. beautiful. Over to you, Karen. Um, looking forward to you sharing a little bit about your journey and um, also sort of how you came to be where you are now. Sure. I kind of want to stay with Tim and hear more of the story. So, um, I knew you were see. Gonna say <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see. Um, gosh, as, as, uh, my, my career has been in sport and that in itself probably gives you an indication of, um, how important it is. So I continue to be an incredibly passionate member, colleague, um, in the Canadian sport community. And I'm going to say, um, with a particular emphasis on access and I'm going to say reimagining kind of the sport, uh, for all of us to participate in. And I, I can honestly say, you know, some people ask, like, don't get tired and no, not at all. And I, I'm probably more excited now with some of the opportunity, whether it be, um, with the emerging views of how we're looking at the impact of sport and physical activity. Um, Tim talked a lot about some of the leadership and coaches, and I was just talking to some a little earlier today, and um, I'm impressed, and I see many of the people on, uh, on, on the participation on the, on the call today, um, uh, kind of the leaders now stepping up and into the conversation and um, also sharing, I'm going to say, a strong responsibility for reshaping um, the conversation. Um, what else is important? Uh, family, friends, community um, is incredibly important. And I, I don't take any of these relationships for granted. So for me, expressed intention and attention is really important, as is a lot of my lessons learned through um, the sport community, which is um, really tight and it's probably helped me also to reshape what friends family community is all about so that's been a key source of uh, information for me uh, and, and also help shape my experience and um, but, you know, um, I think incredibly curious 
Um, I think I, I always believe that um, for me, curiosity and especially about how we can use sport and physical activity um, to create connections, collaborations, community, um, in my view, not to be too esoteric, uh, kind of a new form of democracy, because <laughs> I think that's fundamentally what's being tested in some of our systemic challenges for racism and tolerance right now. So for me, I'm, it's probably why I'm most excited, because when I see some of the strength of leadership and the power in our sport communities, not only what we can do immediately in our programs and services we offer, but using that as a platform and a springboard um, to look at maybe redesigning um, how we uh, look at what's important, whether it be how we treat each other, how we engage with each other, um, and how we kind of move forward as a community, as a nation. So that's, that's probably a bit of an intro. Thank you for that. Um, I always reflect, Karen, to the first time we met, which um, was at your interview to be the CEO for the oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Thank I, you, David Leg. <laughs> <laughs> David's on today, I see. Yeah. Um, and I had flown in, we'd never met before, and I remember you like instantly engaged me in this conversation you asked me all sorts of questions you just like instantly connected to me and it was such a mm -hmm. gift you have such a gift for doing that and um i remember someone after your interview said to me so how long have you and karen known each other it must have been years and i was like mm -hmm. no, just met but you just have this like such an incredible um yeah gift to just kind of connect with people and learn about them really quickly and like make them feel at ease and welcomed so um kudos to you for that and uh, it is something that I've always valued about our relationship is just how much you care and invest in getting to know people. Well thank you for that generous comment but I would also say it's met so um, it was uh, very enticing on both sides so uh, thank you and the only reason I threw up the comment about David Legg because David was then president or outgoing transitioning president of Canadian Paralympic Committee uh, and was the one to say, you should apply. So, and that led me to the conversation with Andrea. So thank you, Andrea and David. <laughs> um, so Tim, you spoke a little bit about sort of finding that belonging for yourself during your involvement with sport. And mm -hmm. so talk to us a little bit about maybe what that felt like and why that mattered and how that contributed to what you're doing now, because you know the beauty of what you bring to what you do now is that connection to each kid that's involved in your program and taking the opportunity to learn about them so you know similar to my comment about karen and her and i's connection i see that gift that you bring to the connection mm -hmm. you're building with the kids in your programs oh, thank you um i think i could honestly say i'd be dead or in jail if it wasn't for sport and i truly mean that. Um, I was a kid who really didn't know where to belong. And I was, as arrogant as it might sound, I was okay at most things at sport and I was average at school and, you know, I could get by, but I did not feel like I ever had a place to like call my own. And so I use sport as this place where I could dance between all these different communities and find one or two people that I could connect with. And, um, and I always think about that. I think about that a lot, especially as like a six foot two, 190 pound white guy who comes from a middle income background of, wow, I had all these opportunities. I had a loving middle-class family who was willing to do anything for me. And I still didn't feel like I belonged, but I had all these opportunities. So now let's layer on the complexity of all the challenges we know children face who don't look like me and the privileges that I have and they don't have. Um, how hard would it be to just get by? And so that drives me every single day. Like daily, I just think about, if I didn't have those few coaches who like, you know, really taught me that I had value in this world and to apply that value elsewhere, where would I be? Again, I would be dead or in jail, 100%. Um, and I think a lot about that with the kids that I work with now is, they, I had so many opportunities, I had so many chances to uh, get up, succeed, fail, get up, succeed, fail, get up, succeed. But we don't, we're, 
if you don't have those and you don't have that opportunity to belong, I just don't know how you do it. Like I really don't. And um, in my adult life, I've been in places too where like I can honestly say I was, I was, you know, on the verge of if I cross that more of an inch, I'm on the street. Like I can honestly say that. And the people that roped me back and pulled me back in are my friends I made through sport and my family. And if you, if you don't have that, like, I, I literally do not know how you make it through life. And so that's kind of one of the things that just keeps driving me day in and day out. And Andrea knows some of the struggles that I've been through lately with programming and um, staffing and uh, even personal life challenges. And um, so that, that's, my, that's my sort of sense of belonging piece is creating those opportunities for kids to have a chance to, all I really care about, I couldn't care how good you kick a ball, how well you shoot a ball, how amazing you are at stick handling a puck. But I do care about, there's a place for you to make a connection with another kid who could be your best friend for life. And I do care about, there could be a connection where there's a mentor, that's someone that can pull you off the line when you need to be pulled off the line, or can hold you up when you're having a great day and you need someone to celebrate with. So yeah, I guess that just kind of anchors in my childhood of knowing the privileges I had and seeing that how would somebody who doesn't have the same privileges that I do, being able to offer some of those and create capacity within the communities for them to be able to offer them themselves. That's a beautiful connection from your lived experience to the lived experience of the kids that you're working with now. And um, yeah, just such a poignant example of like people pulling you back and supporting your journey. So yeah. Yeah. Um, Karen, what about you? What is sort of belonging for you in your journey and how is that showing up and connected you to the work you're doing and to your um, opportunities and experiences? Oh gosh, it's uh, it's everything. I I can't think of uh, something that doesn't dominate or influence um, almost everything I do on a daily basis. Um, I, I'm gonna maybe pick up on one of the things that Tim spoke about, which was privilege first. And I think that um, there are so many assumptions that are laden on on the way our sports system is developed right now which puts so many of us in this conversation right now in the area of inclusion and access because the dominant norms or assumptions of how our system was created was from a very limited experience or perspective. I don't think anybody necessarily woke up thinking that they're gonna do that to exclude, but you know, when there would be two or three people looking like myself, looking at sport for you know, 50, 60 years, then it was a very kind of monocular view. So. Um, it, it kind of puts us in the frame now of looking at inclusion and access into this dominant norm. And uh, one of the projects Andrea and I are working on with uh, Dr. Danielle Pierce and Lisa Tink is reimagining the margins around uh, sport, physical activity, and recreation. And uh, I must say that framing really speaks to me because from a leadership perspective, I can't think of anything, uh, I can't think of a better phrase to position our work because oftentimes when you're in the position of fitting in or inclusion or access, which I believe is an accommodation strategy to bridge, you know, with a system that was designed on uh, set assumptions. And I think, boy, would, would it ever be nice to think that we could just kind of, you know, start from a zero sum base and or release uh, or identify some of those unconscious biases and um, assumptions or recognize our privilege to say, what would it look like if we were all in the room and kind of redesigned uh, versus the kind of wedge principle of uh, inclusion and access. So that's uh, certainly Tim, as you were speaking about privilege, I'm reminded of that and, and kind of philosophically um, for us as leaders, because I always think of the so what for us as leaders and we often move to the action and the orientation. But I think it's so critically important for us to also reflect on, just because I'm in this zone, I'm really driven towards action, um, can I take a step back and reflect on maybe some alternate approaches for how we might want to reconsider or reimagine kind of this environment? Uh, so that's the first thing. And your question about belonging. Um, hmm. I said it was everything um, because I think unless you can bring your whole self, then it's really hard to participate with, you know, slice and dice of uh, parts of you. And I think it's a lot of energy to help manage that. 
um, it was interesting. In one of the Alberta conversations recently, it was Tara. I think I saw Tara on here a little bit ago. She asked me at one of the end, she said, so, you know, what were some of your first experiences? And it reminded me of, you know, kind of like Tim. I was about five foot 10 at six years old. Uh, now what I would describe, like, um, <laughs> not a lot of fundamental movement skills going on. So I hurt myself and others around. So when I discovered the water and aquatics, um, it was my sense of belonging in every way. The water, the environment, um, the summer pool system that for three months of my year was my, my home away from home. Um, at the time, an incredible system where you could be a junior leader, uh, a leader in these really curated support of environments and um, you know learn how to be a volunteer and contribute so that really helped shape my sense of how incredibly valued uh, sport and physical activity was for me um, and what a sense of belonging was um, much like Tim uh, it's pretty impactful when you're growing up and if you don't fit or you don't fit the norm or people don't look like you or people don't include, I mean, at pivotal stages of your, of your development, um, you know, you can kind of go this way or that way. And so I fortunately had the privilege to have that opportunity. And so my sense of belonging was purely shaped by that and is so deep seated uh, in double, significant double digit years. And I guess the only other thing I'd say on that one is, um, as Tim referred to a, a couple of kind of activities or options is that oftentimes when we talk about belonging, um, all our inclusion and, and uh, people think it's big stuff. And again, I always reference that, um, some of the technical quotes are we make up to 35, 35, 38,000 decisions a day. And I always try to think of, oof, even, if, even if I take a portion of those decisions and I can be intentional and attentional for what's important, which is that intention and attention about belonging and ensuring people um, are aligned. Um, I think that... Um, paying attention to those little things um, because I think that sense of belonging and inclusion is made up of those 35,000 decisions we make and how we act a day versus kind of monumental policies, although they help as a backdrop. Um, but I think the stronger action is uh, that commitment and intention and attention as leaders and the space and places we create. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, a fantastic point around you know, connecting the little pieces and what a difference mm -hmm. that can make. And I would say, you know, tying back to my initial statement about sort of our first meeting and like how you mm -hmm. intentionally mm -hmm. connect with people in each interaction. And Tim, you know, I see you cultivate this as well in the coaching calls and just like working with the coaches to kind of meet them where they're at and figure out what they need to be successful in that day, in that moment. And, you know, when the times we're in, there's so many additional layers that people are coming to each interaction with that we need to be conscious of and connecting and supporting people. So maybe let's talk about that for a minute. Like, you know, we're in this time of COVID, we're in this time of, um, you know, this massive race movement, we're in Indigenous History Month, <laughs> we just, we're in Pride Month, we just finished National Accessibility Week, like there's sort of all these things coming at us right now. And how are each of you sort of navigating that in terms of the leadership you bring and connecting with people and supporting them and creating these cultures of belonging? Um, I, I think f for me, particularly given the community that Free Footy serves, um, I've, as a leader, been really trying to keep my ear to the ground, support as much as I can, and get out of the way. Um, I think now is very much a time for people like me to get out of the way, fade into the background a bit, and support as much as I can the people who really need the opportunity to share their voice and we need to hear their voice. Um, and I think at Free Footy, we're pretty lucky of being really well connected to lots of great black leaders, um, lots of great community leaders who when we 
um, want people to come and speak to the kids or speak to our coaches, they're there. Um, and we were also pretty fortunate of having those connections that we know, hey, this person really needs some support right now, let's offer them some support. So I, I'm really focused on like listening as much as humanly possible. Just keep listening and listening, and listening, and always actively reaching out to be able to listen and to hear. Um, and then really secondarily to that, supporting those great leaders who are out there and making sure that their voice is being shared and heard. And as much as humanly possible, we can make sure that voice gets as far as it can. And then, like I say, of getting out of the way a bit of, um, I know that can be kind of controversial because now's the time when everyone needs to speak up, but there's sometimes when I don't think my voice really needs to be heard as much as someone else's does and being able to recognize that and being able to just lend my uh, privileges and my support behind people who I know can do a really great job. So those are sort of the three, I guess, key things that I'm focusing on at the moment, but I don't know if I have the right answer. I don't know if anyone has the right answer right now. It's hard to know what the right answer is sometimes. So I'm just doing what I think has been working in our community so far. And two days from now, that could completely change. And that's another one of the big points in this time is uh, you have to be ready to change and adapt. And uh, that's hard for a lot of people. And I, one of the blessings, I, again, I have from my journalism background is every single day changed, was never the same. And so it gives you, I'm used to kind of rolling a lot. Um, and I think that's one of the hard parts for everyone going forward is getting used to being, not, <laughs> predictability is not gonna be there. It's, it's not gonna be there. And I think it's a good thing. I think it's great. I think it's great that I said it before that uh, I think every one of our institutions is going to be ripped down and rebuilt. I think it's great. Personally, I think it's great. I think it's time to rip a lot of the institutions down, get right under the hood of them and either tinker away or completely rebuilt because a lot of them are really old and built on some really racist stuff, a privilege based stuff that needs to change. So if a few institutions collapse and get rebuilt, I think that's a great thing. Maybe again, controversial to say, but I'm okay with it. <laughs> oh no, <laughs> I'm all for it, Tim. <laughs> <laughs> this is why I knew you two would be a good panelist. <laughs> sure, I'm gonna turn that question over to you. Sure, um, a couple things. Um, first off, I think at last count, June was, I think we're up to about seven campaigns, awareness, and um, so it got me reflecting because, you know, putting your old programmer's hat on, you're going, okay, so here's how I can pick up on the action booklet that uh, all of these various programs have sent me to activate, to increase awareness and education and move on to action. And um, all that did was kind of um, felt a little transactional. It also created kind of a long list of about 100 extra action items. So um, a couple things. Uh, the first step was, okay, um, let's... Let's take a bit of a step back here to see, you know, what's the essence underlying all of this and, you know, kind of the theme of what we're talking about, belonging, <laughs> you know, and um, recreating and reimagining uh, the places and spaces we all operate in from different vantage points. Um, I've, I've had the conversation with several of you kind of in this discussion is that I, um, I, I hesitate to use the label intersectionality because it's so overused now and it's kind of a shortcut too, but it, it, it's, um, it refers to, in my view, a more deeply held sense of kind of an integral experience and perspective. I understand from a programming standpoint that we segment things, so here's para or disability, here's LGBTQIS, here's newcomers, here's this, but we don't know how to put them back together again. So that's what this month felt like. I, I'm not trying to be disrespectful, sometimes short form here, but what it was just causing me to think, what's the essence I can take? What's the attention and intention I, I really want to both myself and with the respective communities I operate in, whether it be CPC or my volunteer work with a, a couple of different groups, um, how can I bring that sense of belonging and maybe reframing, Tim spoke about kind of challenging ourselves to kind of reimagine what it could be. So that's kind of the first thing. Um, I would say the second thing is also talking about it. I, again, I always speak to everybody on this call right now as, you know, a, you know, a leadership role and an opportunity um, to shift the conversation. Because I think particularly in sport and physical activity and recreation, 
we commodify leadership for competency and capability and skill development. And oftentimes we preclude um, some of the things we should be talking about, like belonging or what are the little things you can do. So I think by even introducing that level of conversation as okay, you know, to get beyond the initial kind of snickers or, oh yeah, here she goes with a touchy-feely stuff, <laughs> to validate it because that's the important place that we need to introduce and, and bring some importance and priority and credibility to the whole leadership discussion for how we hold it, how we value it. Um, Tim referred to also supporting others, and I wanted to talk about that for a second because, you know, I see, you know, um, a, a number of people here I work with on a daily basis. You know, Andrea's made a couple of re, um, comments. Lucha Villar, you know, the president of National Paralympic Committee of Peru is on here because she knew Andrea was hosting this and wanted to support. So um, supporting others, and I just want to talk about that for a sec for a sense of belonging that um, I'll speak from my own experience. Um, when either you have the experience of not belonging or you decide to be bold to press the boundaries on different areas that you want to reshape and reform, you're not always the most um, popular person in the room that people are going to galvanize around and, and support. And so I guess I, I would just, I, I can't emphasize how important of um, supporting one another um, to take some of those bold, courageous um, stances, positions. You know, Tim said, well, I might be out in a limb here and, you know, might, might not be as popular, but it, it, I think it's really important, whether it be events like this, to show up for the conversation, to create the conversation, and or not to underestimate how important it is when somebody says something to either edify it, to confirm um, they were heard and or you're there with them to help support. Um, again, um, you know, even though Tim and I both reference and Andrea, you know, to um, experiences of belonging that might have been prior, I would hazard a guess that all of us, myself including, have a little crisis of not being part of things on a daily basis. And it takes so little, you know, when we're involved in courageous conversations or pushing it to help support each other. So small dosage, big impact to say, I'm here, I showed up for you, I hear you, let me know what I can do to help or at least support you from the sidelines. I, I, I really endorse that too. I think that's a great message. And um, it's hard right now to say this, but I think you have to not be afraid to ask a dumb question. You might think it's dumb, but you genuinely want to know because you want to be better and you want to help the people who you serve or you want to help other people. And sometimes you don't know the answer. Yeah. You have to be unafraid to put yourself out there to ask a question about race or culture or gender that you actually have a question about and you need to know the answer because that's going to make you better. And sometimes that means like checking your pride and saying, yeah. I have a question that might sound a bit dumb, but I'm going to ask it because it's important for me to know. And I want, I need to know to help you and to help other people. And I think that's one of the challenges with the, the world over the last generation, quite frankly, is it's very hard to find a safe place to ask a dumb question. And I just use the word dumb because that's how people feel when they say that, but they're not. But um, it's challenging. And it, I think the challenge back as a leader is to create a space where people around you feel safe to ask a question about you or about your program or about the people you serve or about you personally in the way you identify to be able to ask that question because we need a safe space for people to increase their knowledge. And, you know, we all exist in these echo chambers, especially on social media. We just see the same people coming back at us based on an algorithm. So it's very hard to have your spectrum increase. So having the confidence to put up your hand and ask a question, even if you feel like uh, maybe this isn't the right question, it's important. It's really mm -hmm. important. And then on the leadership mm -hmm. side to create a space where people can do that. You know what, Tim, I, I couldn't agree uh, more with you. And it's interesting. I see David on the side there. We were, I, I had the opportunity to participate in a provincial call for Alberta. I think it was last week or a week ago, week and a half ago. It was really interesting because there were no questions in the real time space 
the chat room was blowing up. And I thought, <laughs> how interesting. Um, and it's, you know, now it could have been the physical uh, part of proximity and, and just trying to jump in. But I thought, what a good reminder of how actively engaged and curious people were. And connections, nobody need to facilitate. Hey, do you have this guidance for canoe? Yeah, I've got this over here. I'll get you these accommodations for COVID relief. And so I couldn't agree more with you, Tim. And I think also, because I think about this a lot kind of from a leadership, because I'm, I'm, I remain significantly, um, I'm really conscious of the privilege I have and the role I have on a day-to-day -day basis. And I don't take it for granted at all. And I also am clear, well, clear, in terms of my self-awareness, I'd like to think I hold open the question of my own self-awareness, but I also know there's so many years of privilege on that, that you know it's probably a journey of uh, taking off the layers. But to your comment prior, I think it's surrendering or being clear on some of that assumption base that sets up your leadership, because yep. that's what sets up the fear. I don't know how many times I've been on a meeting or at the end of a half day meeting, people will say, oh my gosh, I'm so glad you asked that question because I didn't think I was in the right meeting. I didn't know. And, and you've got like 20 people who are sitting in a meeting for four hours who didn't know. And I'm going, oh my gosh, what, what a waste of kind of human experience, like human time. So again, how do we set it up that we can be aware of the assumptions or expectations wearing the mantle of leadership because we'd like to pretend and show up and our view of readiness or knowing. Um, and you know what, I, I think many of them are some overinflated false constructs. So how can you surrender? How can you show up a little differently and authentically and either model and or support others if they're quiet? Hey, notice you haven't said anything for a couple hours here. Everything okay? Yeah. Let's take a break. Let's reconnect. You know, there are a whole bunch of different ways to do it to make sure meeting people where they're at, but at least taking the time and space to identify. Sorry, Andrea, Tim and I were just riffing there and I think we went off into about 14 different layers. No, this is perfect. That's exactly okay. what these conversations are. We just play off each other. Okay. Okay. Um, Tara put a really great quote in the chat box. The, mm. the, a quote she saw trending today is normalizing changing your opinion when presented with new information. Normalize changing your opinion when presented with new information. So I thought that was really kind of uh, a great one in there. And then as we were kind of talking about privilege, like as I often describe privilege as not knowing what you don't know because you've never had to know. And so then how, once you do know, how do you take that opportunity to know more and um, use that to be better and to support others in a better way? So, um, yeah, just sort of seemed to on that point too, sorry, I'll just pick up yeah. on a quick, like the famous one that politicians always get flamed on, and this is maybe not a great example, is flip-flopping, right? You say one thing and then you do the next thing. And it's, I, and I, oh, I'm, man, as a journalist, I used to do this all the time with flaming politicians when they flip-flop. This is great fun. But you need to really think about it. This person had an opinion, they were dead set on it, and then they heard the information and they changed. And then we flame them for it. It's, it's, it's a crazy system. It's, it's crazy. And so the fact that now people are hearing something and changing their positions, yay, like, let's celebrate that. You yeah. listen. That, I mean, obviously, that's not the case in all politicians' examples by any stretch of the imagination. But just as a, just a general example on that idea of flip-flop and how people flip-flop, um, I think the fact that if we can have a, a strong position and we can reward the people who say, ah, I heard some stuff, I'm going to make change. Like, let's push those people higher. People that actually listened and adapted and made a change based on it. It's pretty incredible when people do that, especially given how institutional many of us are in terms of the things that we do and the processes that we follow. Let's celebrate the people who adapt and make change. It's fantastic. Yeah. Hard. And, and Hard let, me, let me jump in on that last point, Tim, too. Um, Sorry, Andrew, you're trying to manage us. Let me check. Oh, in you're good. Okay. Okay, good. <laughs> um, is that um, I think, again, as, as much in sport, we've kind of commodified leadership training and coaching training. And, you know, certainly part of my DNA and my reference point when I was talking about, you know, uh, how it, it helped shape my perspective. But I also think part of it, especially when we talk about um, shape shifting some of the sports system and the way we do it, it starts with ourself. And again, our call and our reference point for us as leaders. 
And I think, you know, we, we acknowledge on one hand, oh my gosh, you know, COVID, um, for example, the information's changing on an hourly basis. So, but I would say COVID's not the exception. I would say world events, racial tensions, what's going on, you know, with our economy. The information is um, fast, it's changing. And I would hazard a guess that our view of leadership and uh, how we view the leadership model isn't really in sync. And so Tim referred a couple comments about adaptability, flexibility. Um, again, I, I borrow from kind of my grade eight uh, biology when you talked about a state of osmosis and it was kind of that equilibrium created, but it was that um, dynamic balance between the two spaces and that space in between, which is osmotic, because if a situation changes here, it's going to rebalance and infiltrate the other system. So that's always a helpful con concept for me to think of from a leadership standpoint. And, and I just think, again, I agree there's some core competencies and capacities that are required um, that you need to know. But from a leadership standpoint, I think we have to consider and open up our view in terms of a more dynamic appreciation of how we take in information, how we um, look at a critical construct and, and a critical review, critical analysis of it, and also options. Because I think one of the days that you've got one scenario and it's gonna happen, you know? I, I think so it's a scenario planning through and through and a constant state of adaptation for maximal opportunity. So great quote, Cara. <laughs> Yeah, and I saw something last week that was talking about, forget about planning. Like planning is done. Yeah. We're not doing that anymore. We just need to focus on purpose. What is your purpose? <laughs> it's like, yeah, yeah. I know, Tim, that's not particularly helpful in the discussions that we've been having lately, but it's like, seems to be what 2020 is. Like we are not planning anymore because nothing we plan comes out the way we expect. Let yeah. me let me react to that a little bit, Andrea, because um, one of the things that I'm ha I'm finding also is that yes, not planning, but don't forget the context. Because what I'm finding right now as leaders, you know, we've got concussion, we've got safe sport, we've got COVID, we've got this, and what's happening right now? It's starting to train our own leadership as a reaction, almost buffering or dealing with just an issue orientation all the time, and then that defines our leadership. Great, I am fantastic at concussion and I can do this. I am fantastic at this, but we forget the overall context. So I think, you know, I, I don't want short term or issue reaction. That's why I say yeah. taking a step back as leaders is that we have to have a more global context. It's the sport we want, the sport we want to reframe. And all of these are slices of how to get there, but it's not the whole system. It, it's just a slice. And sometimes I think we forget that because we got really good at figuring out the sport rules to comply with provincial or federal funding or my concussion strategy, and we think the job is done. It is one slice. Yeah, Mark just wrote in the chat box, we are planning to react rather than planning to achieve the outcomes that matter. Absolutely. And so great comment, Mark, as long as we've got that context and outcomes in mind, then it's okay to do the short-term reaction, but it can't be defined just as your reactions. And I'm really good at my short-term muscle leadership reaction. I have a, I have a bit of a business coach that I talk. He he volunteers his time. His name's Michael Power Powell, and um, he we sat down the other day for a chat, and he said I was stressing about all these things of change and how I'm going to manage this program and all this responsibility for looking after all these families. And he just said to me, he's like Tim, like hold on. Your mission is to serve vulnerable families and vulnerable youth. If it's not in the way you did it before and it's in a different way, that's okay. If you switch everything over to food and leadership for a period of time, because the play stuff, we can't do it at the moment. That's okay. Like just know that at your core, your core mission is to serve vulnerable kids and vulnerable families. And what can you do to do that? It might not be anything re remotely similar to what you did before. But as long as you're still staying to your core mission and supporting the people you care about, love, and want to support, then you're doing your job. I think that's important to remember too. What is your what are your core values? What is your core mission? You stay true to that. Mm -hmm. How you program it out look, might look entirely different, and that's completely okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I do want to encourage. We have a few minutes for questions. If folks want to post any in the chat box. Um, 
And I think that's a really tremendous point, Tim. And I mean, you've done a phenomenal job during COVID of pivoting the services mm -hmm. you provide to provide food and to provide online opportunities for the kids in your program. So do you wanna to just touch on that a little bit? We didn't talk about food at all yet, and that has been such an innovation that you've created. Yeah, we, um, I guess when, when COVID really started, we, we had this kind of terror moment where this, the, our email box just started filling, like filling floods of emails of people saying, I need food support because they were out of work, they were at home, they were now at home with uh, no school support, so they're at home with five or six kids. They couldn't get out to the grocery store for numerous reasons. And um, we really sort of just opened our eyes of saying, okay, what, what is our space? Our space is, is a narrow sort of lane of play and sense of belonging and community. And food is over here and often other people do food, but for some reason or another, they weren't getting access to those traditional spaces, which is probably a conversation for outside of here because food is a whole other realm of politics. Um, but we, yeah, we managed to make some really good uh, relationships with the food bank here and a local uh, grocery store, Giant Tiger. And we ended up serving now about 150 families a week worth of food from our, our list, which doesn't even get close to covering the number of people that need it. But it's going to those core families that are within our program who need a bit of food support. So it was really just a pivot of, again, what are our core values? What are we really about? What we're really about is helping vulnerable families, whether that's through a play lens, a community lens, or now a food lens. And quite frankly, it might not be play, but it's definitely community. It's definitely a sense of belonging when someone brings you some food and connects to you and helps you with some recipes. So yeah, we pivoted there. And then on the online side, Andrea has been helping me with some of this too, is we um, flipped all our coaching calls to be online. We have that junior coaching program that I mentioned. So the high school kids, they check in and we do a, a game day prep, which is actually today at three o'clock here, where they we work through a practice plan with them. And then sometimes we have a guest speaker come on after. And then uh, on Wednesday, we deliver our programming online to kids who have access to it, which is definitely is not the 4,000 we're used to serving. <laughs> but um, they come into a Zoom session. They're all in what we call the gym like this. And we have 10 or so different breakout rooms. And in each breakout room is a couple of coaches and the kids get sent to a breakout room based on the team they're on before. And they go in and do a session. Uh, it's been challenging. It's been really tough. Um, but talking to anyone who's a provider of online programming, especially for kids in need, they're all uh, experiencing the same thing. And it's kind of heartbreaking, frankly, um, that you don't get that same level of buy-in as we did in real life. Um, but there's a million reasons for it. And it's the same with school too. I mean, I talk to the kid, parents that go to my kid's school who are the most privileged you can imagine, and they're not even sending their kids to school. So there's all these different factors and a lot of the kids uh, programs that are in social service spaces like ours are going through the same challenges. That doesn't make it any better that we're not getting to the kids. I don't take me, but uh, I don't know how to take that. But um, um, the fact that the programming is still there and it's consistent and is there as an option and it's getting blasted out by email every week um, to kids to sign in is yeah sort of how we've adapted. Yeah and Karen what about you like um, you know Tim's obviously running a pretty different program than you are with sort of a staff team and national team athletes like how has how have you pivoted in terms of your ability to connect with the people in uh, the CPC circle. Yeah, um, you're right. It's a, a little bit different. Um, kind of our major event was delayed a year. Um, and so we've got um, both our own immediate team and um, our volunteers who support us in our, our board and our committees. Um, so to make sure they're safe and healthy and have transitioned uh, to working uh, remotely and also whatever it means for them, depending upon their circumstances. And then I would say um, unraveling what it means to delay uh, the games by a year, uh, because there are a lot of associated uh, I mean, qualifying plans, trips, things like that, um, to make sure that there's the continuity of care and also support for all of our athletes um, and the teams. 
I would say there's a layer also, and probably this is, I'm gonna say far more experienced by our, our national sport organization members. So like uh, wheelchair rugby or wheelchair basketball, who all of a sudden you had an athlete, um, in this case, many athletes across so many of our, our members who were preparing, had a goal, had a focus, and all of a sudden that's delayed a year. So whether it be life decisions, whether it be uh, their own planning and preparation, uh, their own mental health, uh, in terms of uh, reformatting um, kind of their plans uh, and the support structures they need um, is uh, probably at the top of the list. So I would say there are a number of little points uh, in this overall picture uh, to be mindful of and to make sure everybody's talking to one another. I think the last part I, I'd comment on is um, when things don't go as planned, oftentimes um, it's easy uh, in some cases to miss some of the people that self-isolate or choose not to be part of the conversation. And so it's easier, it's easy to have a, a Zoom call or you know, for those that either have the confidence or mental health or feeling good who say, yep, yeah, I'll show up and I'll be there. But um, at times like this, um, Andrea, I think it's most important for all of us to pay attention for those that aren't there, which is probably a little bit of a moniker for all of us throughout all of our programs, I know. But particularly during this, um, I just started to notice a cadence for how and when and where people showed up. So probably spending a little extra time myself just making some outreach calls for some of the people that regardless of circumstances, just are not connected and you know what what can we do to help support or if it's if it's space you need but uh what what do you need to, to kind of uh, engage that is probably a perfect wrap-up comment karen <laughs> <laughs> tim do you want to do a last word because that uh, we're running out of time as we do every week on bridges of belonging <laughs> no, that, that was a fantastic um closing remark and i would just say that um, this is the group of people who are who can make the change. Quite frankly, that um, I think we sell sport the wrong way a lot of times. I really do, of not selling the community and the belonging aspect and what we and the mental health aspect that we all get from playing together um, and having a mentor. So I just like I would just say just try try your best. It's kind of glib to say, but. Try not to get too disheartened about your role because your role, quite frankly, is one of the most important roles you can get outside of my, in my opinion, outside of the teachers and the schools. After that, it's the coaches and the dance instructors and the piano teachers, people that have that direct relationship with kids and youth and adults. Um, so you are a huge part of um, the recovery from COVID and the changes that we all want to see when it comes to race and inclusion. So thank you. I would thank everyone who's taking the time to be on this call and I just keep encouraging you to keep being amazing, awesome human beings. Mm. Well, that's a, definitely a great wrap up comment as well. So thank you so much, uh, both Tim and Karen. As I said, I just feel so grateful to have both of you in my life, my life and to be able to see the leadership you're bringing and the vulnerability that you're facing and some of the challenging circumstances and just how you always connect to your values and to the work that you're doing and the purpose of the work that you're doing. So um, I was uh, grateful you said yes and uh, that you've been able to spend this hour with us sharing your insights into your belonging journey. Um, I do want to share next week's um, session, which is going to feature uh, Dina Bell LaRoche and um, Marco Pasca, who's um, a disability advocate and consultant. And I'm um, looking forward to our fifth Bridges of Belonging conversation as we continue this journey together, learning and sharing and being vulnerable and having these conversations that will just continue to connect us as we move forward. So thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, wishing you all a wonderful day and stay safe. Thanks everybody. All right, take care. Thanks very much everyone.